Yeah, so thank you, Tom, for this very kind introduction. Uh, could you just confirm if you see my presentation appropriately? Yeah, all good. Yeah, perfect. So it's really a pleasure to join you for this really interesting and sophisticated webinar. And uh, my part is actually to introduce the Atrex Power Peak Plate and to give some insights about the principle of high ostibial osteotomy. And why, what I want to remark at the beginning is that when we are talking about indications, we are not exclusively talking about unicompartmental OA, but we are also uh, talking about treatment of ligamentous instabilities. We are talking about osteotomies as protective uh, concomitant surgeries in cartilage repair. And we are also talking about osteotomies being used for patellofemoral pathologies. Since I'm talking about HTO, the issue of patellofemoral pathologies is not that important because usually femoral osteotomies are uh, used in order to treat patellofemoral instability or patellofemoral OA. But nevertheless, the other three parts remain also indications uh, for HTO. Recently, especially in Germany and Europe, but probably also worldwide, the topic of tibia slope really came into focus when we are talking about uh, instability of the knee joint. This has been an issue, especially for posterior instabilities for a long time, but recently the topic of uh, tibia slope increase, for instance, in ACL revision surgery really came into focus, but I will not really uh, talk about that because we have another talk on ACL and osteotomies uh, coming up during this session. Another indication for HTO in instabilities of the knee joint is definitely the hyperextension varus thrust, and there has been some publications that once you're doing an osteotomy exclusive and as an isolated uh, sta uh, standalone treatment, you are really um, able to address also these uh, virus thrust uh, problems appropriately. Nevertheless, the classic indication, and that's what I will be talking about in the next couple of minutes, is definitely osteotomies for asymmetric weight bearing um, in cartilage repair and osteoarthritis. And within the recent years, when talking about concepts for cartilage repair, we really became very strict with alignment issues. And we experienced that also in mild uh, deformities, such as two or three decrease of virus, an additional osteotomy is definitely a benefit for the patient. Uh, Gerrit Bode from our group in Freiburg actually published a paper that demonstrated clear superiority, superiority of ACI with concomitant HTO, even in these mild deformities. And since I'm the first uh, speaker today, I just want to also uh, give some principal comments on alignment and analysis of deformity because this is the essential analysis for all osteotomies we are going to talk about today. And in my personal opinion, at least these angles should be determined in every patient considered for a realignment procedure. And based up of the, on the principle of Tropeli, who actually stated that the best location of deformity correction is location of the deformity, you should really distinguish between deformities located on the femur and those on the tibia. And it is not true that all the deformities, all varus deformities are located on the tibia. Um, for many, many years, actually, it was uh, an, uh, in, uh, the, actually there was the principle of having the varus corrected on the tibia, but this should be done anymore. You should really go for a careful analysis of the deformity. And once there is a femoral virus deformity, as in this case, with the pathologic angle of the distal femur, you should definitely not go for a tibial osteotomy. Otherwise, you this actually leads to an oblique joint line, which is definitely a problem in 
uh, the aftercare and rehabilitation and further clinical course of the patient. This also leads to the issue of double osteotomy. There will also be a talk on that specific really important topic uh, during the session today. But nevertheless, just the remark from my side, once you have a significant combined tibial and femoral deformity, Double osteotomy is definitely something which came into focus and which clearly is indicated in order to avoid this oblique joint line problem. This is a study from Matthias Feucht, colleague of mine or former colleague of mine in Freiburg, now also based in, uh, in Stuttgart. And he analyzed virus deformity in more than 300 subsequent patients. And what he actually found just confirms what I was saying before that a majority or a large proportion of these patients with virus deformities uh, do not suffer from isolated tibial deformities, but rather have combined or even isolated femoral deformities. So um, really uh, be aware of that and not really uh, think that all virus deformities needs to be corrected on the tibia. Nevertheless, there are isolated tibial virus deformities as indicated in this patient, and this is definitely a patient that really qualifies for a high tibial osteotomy. In my personal opinion, once you have a tibial, osteotomy, uh, a tibial virus deformity, you should add another parameter which I personally consider really important, and this is the tibial bone virus angle. Um, you can see that on the right side. Um, it actually um, connects the epiphyseal line and sets this in an angle with the uh, tibial axis. And once you determine this angle, you can really distinguish between an intra-articular and an extra-articular vagus. And we have actually published a study on that issue a couple of years ago, even 11 years ago. And this is one of the best prognostic parameters in terms of uh, good clinical outcome following open wedge high tibial osteotomy. And we also use that parameter in order to distinguish um, our indication between unicompartmental knee replacement and HTO. Um, it sounds rather clear. If you have an intra-articular deformity, we rather go for unicompartmental intra-articular therapy. And once we have a pathological TBVA, uh, this re represents an extra-articular deformity. And in our opinion, this indicates an extra-articular therapy, meaning our HTO. This is just a video sequence how we do our HTO. This is the Ramos Infrapatellaris from the Safenos branch. Here you see the pes anorinus, the medial collateral ligament, and we actually just go beneath this uh, superficial fibers of the uh, medial collateral ligament. This is a preparation which usually not long, takes not longer than two or three minutes. And afterwards, this hook is placed just posterior to the tibia in order to protect the neurovascular structures. The osteotomy is uh, performed under continuous uh, radiographic control. Actually, we set up the, uh, the image intensifier parallel to the lateral plateau, and this is how we actually also orientate our uh, saw. What I want to uh, point out is that we really go for biplanar osteotomies in all our cases. And the typical biplanar osteotomy, as you probably know, is the proximal uh, osteotomy. But we also do this uh, specific uh, um, um, osteotomy really frequently, leaving the typical tib uh, tibial tubercle on the proximal part of the osteotomy in order to reduce the patellofemoral pressure or at least not to increase the patellofemoral pressure, um, which is indicated in large corrections, pre-existing patella baja, or in patients suffering from uh, previous patellofemoral cartilage uh, defects 
in unicompartimental medial uh, or, or OA. So the percentage of patients in which we do this uh, modified technique is probably 30 to 40 percent, and it has definitely increased significantly in recent years. Here you see how this works uh, in the OR. Soft tissue protection is really important anterior, but the tubic, uh, the tuberosity is really left in place. And then since this modification of the HTO really results in a higher instability, we use an um, leg screw in order to refixate uh, the tuberositis um, in uh, this osteotomy setting. This is the post-operative uh, um, uh, radiograph. Here you can see the open wedge osteotomy using the Atrex power peak plate, which really allows visualization of the consolidation afterwards very nicely. And you see the additional leg screw for refixation of the tibia tuberositis. Again, Gavit Bode from our crew performed a biomechanical analysis of this modified uh, uh, technique. And what he was really clearly be uh, what he was able to show really clear was that once you do this modification, you achieve a reduction of the patellofemoral pressure and probably patients with pre-existing cartilage defects or pre-existing patella baja really benefit from that modification. The next surgical point I wanted to point out is the issue of tibial slope. As I mentioned before, you can really aim on changing the tibial slope, but probably in the standard cases, you just want to leave it unchanged during the procedure. And what I want to point out is that in these cases, you really need to open the gap asymmetric since different diameters of the tibia in the anterior and posterior part lead to a different edge high. And this is something which is just pure mathematics, but you really need to be aware of that during the surgery. That's why we put the spacer really posterior on the cortex. And then once you open up the gap posteriorly, you achieve a neutral opening in, in terms of uh, the tibial slope. Uh, this is probably something everybody is aware of, of, but I just wanted to point out because I personally consider that really important. And sometimes it's really hard to open up the gap because the posterior cortex of the tibia needs to be cut really carefully and sometimes even two uh, instruments, one placed anterior and the other posterior, help in order to make this asymmetric opening of the gap from the medial side in order to uh, prevent a slope change following the osteotomy. And the last technical issue I want to point out is the issue of hinge fractures. And this is something which has been considered uh, more or less problem, uh, more or less normal, at least for the type 1 stable fractures. Uh, but to be honest, I really recommend to avoid these hinge fractures because a loss of correction is described in li literature once these hinge, hinge fractures occur. A prolonged consolidation process of the osteotomy gap has been described. And for the unstable types of hinge fracture, fracture this is definitely a catastrophe for your individual patient. So you definitely should try to avoid. And there are some interesting strategies in order uh, to avoid. And once is this hinge uh, K wire, which we insert uh, once we observe large corrections, or if a type one hinge fracture occurs intraoperatively, as you can see here in this patient who underwent a large correction for a double, uh, double osteotomy, and he suffered a type one hinge fracture during the surgery. And in these cases, you really can insert this hinge wire in order to stabilize the osteotomy. And how impressive that is, is shown by this Sorbon uh, video. Here you see this type hinge fracture, which occurs during the opening, and you really see how instable the situation is. And by inserting just one little K-wire, 
And you can really help to stabilize the situation really impressively uh, during the surgery and really sufficient during the surgery. And in approximately 60 to 70 percent of our osteotomies, uh, talking about larger correction, we also used this K wire as prevention for hinge uh, fracture. And this turned out to be really sufficient. Here you see how by just introducing this one K wire, the stability of this hinge fracture really increases uh, dramatically. So just go for that hinge wire um, in, in larger corrections, or if you are afraid of producing uh, type one hinge fracture. And the last point of my talk is about implants, because the choice of the implant is really something which is essential in my personal point of view. There have been biomechanical studies performed uh, by many colleagues, including this study by Jens Agneskircher from Hannover, published uh, 13 years ago. And what he found is that an open wedge osteotomy from a biomechanical point of view is a really demanding uh, surgery and that actually plate fixtures using angle stable implants should be the gold standard in my personal opinion. The tumor fix plate from Synthes is definitely a gold standard, but nevertheless, it's kind of big. We have also published some results that demonstrated that um, in many cases, approximately 60% of the cases, soft tissue irritation is an issue. And this is actually why the power peak plate because became our standard implant in recent years from a biomechanical point of view, as shown in this biomechanical testing here, it is pretty similar to the Tomofix plate, which is the gold standard from a biomechanical point of view, but nevertheless, um, adds the benefit that due to this peak uh, design, you can really observe the consolidation process during the clinical course after the high tibial osteotomy. And due to the variation of angle stability, you are also able to avoid conflicts, for instance, with the tibial tunnel in case of an ACL reconstruction. But this is an issue we will be talking later uh, on. Here at uh, the end, you see uh, the how the Atrex plate works in place. Uh, fixed with angle stable screws at the end of the surgery. And we are really positive. To be honest, I have not uh, um, experienced a single complication using that plate for now uh, 10 years. So thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. And I'm really excited about uh, the following talks of this webinar.